We are live. Okay, thank you. I guess I'll wait for a minute or so till my clock turns. <laughs> I thought he was kind of fully retired, but he keeps showing up. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Good, thank yes. you. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, a session on uh, with invited talks and a panel uh, on data log uh, perspectives. And we have uh, three very eminent uh, people in this area who did all of who've done very foundational work and early work uh, on data log, uh, the language and its implementation, its uses. Uh, we have Jeff Ullman, who I'm sure everybody knows uh, from his textbooks, his uh, research and databases, his, um, and of course, most recently, his uh, Turing Award uh, that he received this year. Uh, and then we have Dave Meyer, who is uh, also out of the relational database and then a object-oriented database communities, who um, is actually the namer of data log. He's the one who gave the name and maybe he'll tell us about that or we can ask him in the panel session. And finally, we have Moshe Vardy, who is an eminent researcher uh, in logic, in model theory, in uh, all kinds of, of logic uh, areas. He's uh, also organizationally very well known. He is a former uh, editor of the journal, the ACM. He is the uh, original originator of the uh, FedLog conference. Uh, uh, and um, anyway, so we have very, three wonderful people to talk to us today and for us to ask questions of. Uh, at the end and to, to try to get a discussion going. So the organization will be uh, an hour of talks, 20 minutes each, uh, and then a half an hour of questions, discussion, uh, and anything else we wanna do. Okay, so without further ado, I'll uh, let Jeff uh, start his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, David, for uh, organizing this. I'm going to try to share my screen. I hope this works. Uh, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, 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 uh, I've been forced to sort of remember from way, way back um, in the dawn of time, sort of what I was doing. Uh, and I'm really going to focus on the world, oh, I think it was about 1983, um, when I sort of got interested in this, this question of, of logic as a, um, as a query language. Um, and at that time, uh, I guess there, there, were, there were two schools of thought um, and in a sense, one was too hot and one was too cold. And I tried to uh, find the thing that was, you know, just, just right. Uh, so you have Ted Codd, who about a, a dozen years before had uh, talked about query languages and he gave, um, uh, it's, well, what he called tuple, uh, tuple relational calculus and, and, and domain relational calculus which were, were basically single uh, horn, uh, horn clauses, not recursive, uh, no, no functions. Uh, and then uh, there was Jack Minker and, and a number of, of people uh, around him uh, coming more, I think, out of the AI community. And they were, they had sort of very ambitious uh, view of what a, a database query would be in, in logic. So um, they, they were really talking about, um, you know, arbitrary theories, uh, arbitrary sets of, of first order rules. Now, uh, 
uh, you know, again, the problem with the cod was, was too cold, if you will. Uh, first of all, the relational algebra is just, is, is seems to be an easier way to, to think about, um, uh, about queries in, uh, of, of, of this type. And there were things you wanted to say, such as recursions, uh, that really were not part of, uh, of, of Cod's, uh, Cod's world. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 uh, what I'm gonna call the Minker approach uh, was too hot because there were a lot of things you, ju you just couldn't optimize. Uh, it, it, and, and I might comment that you really, you, you need to optimize your queries because the obvious way to execute uh, the, the query was um, it first infer all of the true uh, the, uh, all the true statements and then see which one of the ones of them answered your query and then that was obviously just just too wasteful uh, on the other hand I think coming out of the Minker school, was something a, a, a paper that was very influential in my thinking, uh, and and so I want to really talk about that first. Uh, uh, this was done. By, this is a paper by Henshin and Nakvi, uh, and uh, while I actually uh, I think dealt with more general problems, what, what I saw it as was it was an efficient way of evaluating linear recursions, uh, and. Uh, a general linear recursion, uh, you can think of the, eva the, the evaluation as you have to go back uh, n generations, uh, then you use the basis rules, and then you go forward for the same n generations. Now I'm gonna give you an example, which is in fact a, a genealogy example, but, uh, but you can, in more generally, you can think of a, of a generation as simply one application of the recursive rules. Okay, so let's just focus on this sort of classical, uh, the, the cousin or same generation uh, problem where uh, you, you say, um, uh, let's say, well, first of all, there's a database uh, of, of persons uh, it's important because that everything be uh, be made finite. Uh, so you have you have a finite set of persons. Uh, you have a parent relation that is XP is a parent of X, uh, and presumably X and XP are, are persons, although that's not strictly uh, necessary. Uh, so the basis says that every person is their own cousin, and then recursive rule says X and Y are cousins if uh, they have parents XP and YP respectively and XP and YP are cousins. And then the query that you normally want to ask is uh, find all the cousins of some fixed individual A. Now, the naive solution is you, re you just compute the cousin relation. Uh, and if you look, it's got to be finite if if the parent relation and the, and the person's are, uh, relation are, are finite, uh, and then you uh, find from that relation all of the uh, uh, the, the cousins of A, uh, and uh, well, this is obviously going to be wasteful because not everybody. You're computing facts that have nothing to do with A uh, intuitively. So the way, uh, let's see, I guess this is sort of my interpretation of what Henshin and Anakvi were trying to do. Uh, they actually use the successor function. I'll just use arithmetic instead. Uh, so the first thing they would do is compute a relation, which I'll call back, where uh, intuitively back of Xn means that, um, uh, that X is, is an nth generation ancestor of X. So um, A is a zero by the, uh, is a zeroth uh, generation ancestor of, of, of himself. Uh, and then the recursive rule of course says that uh, XP is uh, an n generation an ancestor if 
XP is a parent of somebody X and X is an N minus one generation uh, uh, ancestor of, uh, of A. And then uh, you start, you can at any time start moving forward and um, forward of XN then means that uh, in order to get, one way to get cousins of A is to go N generations forward from X. So if you've gone X, if X is, some, is in back, uh, well, if X, let's say if back of XN is true, that is uh, X is an, an N generation ancestor of A and is also a person, that's the basis. Uh, then uh, going forward in all possible ways from X in N, for N generations uh, will lead you to some of the cousins of A. And then the recursive rule says, uh, that you have, you need to go forward n minus one generations from x if x has a parent uh, xp and you have to go n generations forward from uh, from xp and then finally uh, the cousins of uh, of a are those x such that you have to go forward zero generations uh, from x now why is this better than the obvious method well, if you think about it, you never look at any individual who isn't somehow related to A. So if most of your database is just un totally unconnected to A, you never look at that. Whereas if you had to compute the whole cousins relation, uh, you'd be looking at all sorts of irrelevant uh, stuff. Okay, so, uh, I think it was, I guess it was actually not the summer, it was I think the winter of, uh, of 1984. I was uh, on sabbatical at Hebrew University. And uh, I started uh, thinking about uh, sort of this, this Goldilocks problem of, you know, is there a more reasonable logical query language uh, that sort of sits in between the Cod view and, and, and the Minker view? And I said, uh, uh, okay, well, maybe sets of horn clauses. Uh, now I wanted to avoid function symbols. And remember the Henshin and, and Nakfi approach used function symbols to do the, the counting. Again, what I showed as arithmetic is really application of a successor function uh, n times two to zero. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, it, turn, it turns out, you know, we learned later that you can you can do sort of the same thing without function symbols. Uh, okay, and of course, we want everything to be finite. In the in the database world, there are no infinite sets. Um, so uh, I assume that there would be some predicates that really were re represented database relations. That's what they're called EDB now or, or extensional database predicates. Uh, and those are always finite uh, by force. And um, then there will be uh, IDB predicates, which are uh, then defined by these horn clauses. And uh, to make sure that you didn't accidentally create an infinite set uh, as, a, as, as the extent of an IDB predicate, uh, uh, you want to make sure that any variable that appears in the head will also appear in the body. And that's enough to guarantee that, that no, you, you, never, you never have to invent uh, values that don't appear in the database. Now, uh, I, I had you know th this this uh, idea that you the that there would be different methods of optimizing different kinds of structures. I mean, again, this is you know the idea that Henshin and Nakfi sort of works for linear uh, uh, linear rules. So, okay, well maybe uh, I want to break up the predicates and use a different algorithm to uh, handle uh, to handle different uh, uh, different really logical structures uh, let's put it that way uh, and my, my, my 
you know, my first intuition was that you needed to form a dependency graph where there's an arc, well, the nodes, of course, are the predicates, and there's an arc from P to Q. If uh, P appears uh, is the predicate and the sub goal for, for uh, some rule uh, for, for Q. And again, the idea is that you can divide the dependency graph into strong components. Typically, a strong component will be small. Uh, anything that's not recursive is, of course, a strong component by itself. But even if, so, if a predicate's recursive, often it just depends on itself or there is some small neutral recursion. So you'll have two or three predicates in, in one strong component. And of course, the, the dependency graph is acyclic. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the graph of strong components is acyclic. So you can evaluate one strong component by itself assuming that everything below it is already evaluated and is effectively uh, a, a, an EDB or, or a database uh, predicate. Okay. And then at the end, this, as I said, this idea that, uh, that different methods will be used for different strong components. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I I think I very quickly uh, figured out that that life was a little bit more uh, complicated because, uh, again, when you, when you're querying, uh, each predicate is really being used as a function where some of its arguments are given uh, are, are given bindings that is uh, they're bound to a finite set of values and. Our goal or the, or the purpose of the query is to find uh, the associated values for the remaining arguments. Okay, so uh, I, I, I started breaking up uh, or creating different versions of the same predicate by using what I called an adornment, uh, which is just a, super, a superscript, which is a list of uh, Bs and Fs. Uh, for bound and free uh, that tells you sort of which arguments, the bound arguments are the input and the free arguments are the, out, are the, uh, the output. So for example, if the query is cousin uh, with the first argument an individual and the second argument is let's, uh, you know, says basically let's find all the cousins of the individual A. So that's an example of the cousin predicate in, in, in with the bound free uh, adornment. So you get a more, uh, more, more, uh, let's say, uh, expanded de dependency graph, and uh, now the nodes are not just predicates, but they are uh, adorned predicates. Uh, so uh, uh, now, so now, but basically, what you have to do is you you have to put the right adornments on each rule on the predicates of each rule, and there may be different choices uh, depending upon the binding in the, the head. So, uh, so I want to um, give you an example in a second. Uh, so for, first of all, how you propagate adorn, uh, these adorn pre uh, the adornments uh, from the head to the sub goals really depends on the order in which you evaluate the sub goals. I'm going to assume it's left to right order, uh, but of course we can reorder the sub goal as, as we like. Uh, now, uh, the way you determine whether a, a, the occurrence of a variable in, in some rule is bound or not, well, it's bound if either it's bound in the head or it has appeared in a previous subgoal, because if you evaluate the subgoal of left to right, every subgoal gets bound to a, um, a, a finite set of, uh, a finite set of, uh, set of facts. And that set of facts will then bind every variable uh, that appeared in that sub goal. So ju just to give you uh, an, an, an example, uh, let's suppose that again, our query is, is, is cousin bound free. The first argument is, is the input. Uh, well, uh, if I work from left to right, uh, now for the parent sub goal X, is bound in the uh, in the head, so it's going to be bound in the subgoal. XP hasn't appeared yet, so 
it's going to be free. So this is an instance of parent bound free. What this says is since parent is a database relation, uh, it says I have to query, I'll be given a, uh, a binding or bindings for X and I have to look up in the, in the, the parent database uh, who the parents of each of the bio, bound values of, of, of X are. Now, how about the second sub goal? Well, Y uh, appears in the head, but it's free in the head, so it's not going to be bound. And YP hasn't appeared yet. So this is an instance of parent free free. That is, give me the whole parent relation. That's kind of bad. Um, moreover, when I come to cousin, um, the cousin sub goal, XP appears in a previous sub goal, so does YP. So they're both bound. And so this is an instance of, of cousin bound, bound, if you will. Uh, now, th this is not, uh, it's, it's, it's not a killer, but it's not ideal either because the sub goal, um, the cousin, uh, uh, the cousin bound free depends on another version of cousin, namely bound, bound. Um, now, you'd have to then do the same process for with cousin bound bound in the head and, and see what you get, you'd actually get. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you, you get an, another version of the cousin rule. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if you order them right, then you just find that cousin bound free is, it depends only on itself. Uh, so, um, Again, here's, here is the, the right ordering where the cousin appears in the middle. Now, a parent, again, is, is, this is a bound free instance. Now, XP is bound because it appeared in a previous sub goal. YP is still free. So this is an instance of cousin bound free. And then for the, the second parent sub goal, Y appears only in the head, but it's free. YP has appeared previously. So this is an example of uh, parent free bound. Uh, that's okay, because parent is a database relation. You, you, you can, uh, it has no rules anyway. So, so that's not a real problem. Uh, uh, okay, and then, the, then you, have to, you have to also do the, the basis rule. Uh, that's not uh, all that interesting. So this leads in this case to a, a, a simple dependency graph with the bindings, again, cousin uh, bound free depends only on, on itself and uh, versions of the uh, database relations. So the two different, two different. Jeff, versions. we're about we're about twenty, a little over twenty minutes in. Okay, sorry. Yes, I am actually. I only have one more slide. Thanks. Uh, okay, so I, I, well, it's, it's really just a confession. Uh, with, with all of the framework that I created, I didn't really do much. Uh, if you look at the, the original paper, uh, there were some uh, algorithms for uh, left and right linear recursions. Uh, uh, but there was a lot of, I think, very interesting structure, which I'm hoping the next uh, speakers will talk about, um, uh, leading to algorithms like especially magic sets uh, and uh, uh, a number of extensions that really went beyond the, the uh, original uh, horn clause framework that I tried to, uh, to promote. Uh, okay, so with that, I will, uh, uh, I'll stop my, my sharing and let, uh, let you proceed. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Very okay. interesting. So next we have, uh, we'll, we'll hold, I'm sure there are questions, but we'll hold questions till the panel session. I think it's better unless they're really critical. So let's move on. Dave, Dave Meyer, are you ready? Okay. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, uh, there was a lot of interest in uh, the set of, of sort of horn logic or data log uh, in various versions starting around the mid eighties. Um, and I'd like to talk about sort of there was after that, there was kind of a waning of interest. And then more recently, things have picked up and there's now renewed interest in data log. And I sort of like to dig into why that might be. So uh, this is adapted from uh, a paper I wrote with uh, Tunke 
Tikla, uh, Mike Kiefer, and Dave Warren, um, sort of giving a history and outlook for for data log, and um, it's uh, based on the section one point seven of that. Uh, I want to share the blame for this because when I was writing this chapter, I uh, solicited opinions from a number of people, including a couple of my uh, co-panelists today uh, to see why they thought in particular there was this waning of interest in data log. Um, and so what are some of the reasons that that came out that why data log, uh, interest in data log sort of waned during the, uh, the 1990s? Um, well, one reason um, is that there wasn't really anything that was seen as a killer application, you know, that you just had to have data log to do this. Um, you know, it would be nice to compute my cousins, but in fact, the hard part of that is coming up with the database, not answering the query. Um, and there were often for particular things that really needed recursion, like bill of materials and manufacturing resource planning, there were specialized applications such as uh, I, IBM had a, Copix had a module for this. Uh, there were also at the beginning some theoretical and, and practical limitations about, um, you know, how could you evaluate some of these things, you know, especially in the database mode where, um, you know, you're looking for sort of all answers and not all proofs of something. Um, and then there's just limits on hardware, particularly main memory about what you could actually accomplish there. And so you had to worry about uh, <clears throat> Uh, disk if you were going to use this for, for database applications. Um, there were some bottom-up approaches, but they had the downside that uh, you could have a blow up in, in program size. Uh, those free bound annotations could really, um, if, you, if you had a lot of variables and a lot of patterns, all of a sudden you've got very many more uh, predicates going on. And it was starting to be tabling for top down, but there were still issues about how are you going to do uh, negation and incremental evaluation and what's the best way to schedule sub goals so it was coming along but it was a bit immature um another thing going on was that there was just less mind share for logic programming um altogether uh there was sort of this ascendancy at the time sort of started in the 80s of um uh object-oriented programming and people became interested in that and I, I confess myself I went over to the dark side um, and worked on object-oriented databases after I worked on data log. Um, there were a lot of these desktop workstations coming in, object-oriented languages seemed good for interactivity and graphics um, and programmer, programmer productivity was sort of focused on at that time it seemed to me um, working on graphical interfaces on these desktop powerful desktop machines and um you know interactive uh click and drag kinds of interfaces and it didn't seem to be as much uh demand for sophisticated query and analysis there was also just some antipathy from the database systems community um there were people who just really for reasons i don't quite understand this really want it seem to beat up on um, these logic approaches to databases. Um, some of the same people like to beat up on object-oriented databases. So I was, was aware of that. Um, and part of it was, I think, the nature of research papers is people were coming up with evaluation techniques um, and proposing them, maybe reasoning about their completeness, but not necessarily implementing them or benchmarking them. And so, you know, database, people are sort of suspect about, okay, here's a language, but, um, you know, can I, is it going to take days to evaluate queries on it? Um, there's also just a lot of, you know, these uh, data log and other logic languages for databases where I think some people thought, okay, this is going to be the next version of database management systems. Um, and they gave you this more expressive querying. You can now do transitive closure kinds of things. But there's a lot else you need for a database system, such as concurrency control, recovery, indexing, authorization, backup. 
and so forth. Um, and some of those are quite complex to implement. Concurrency control and recovery in particular, uh, where you have sort of non-determinism going on. Uh, and some people said, well, let's just take an existing DBMS as a submodule and get all those databasey features, and then we'll, you know, have our um, recursive language interface on top of that. But that gives you sort of a complicated optimization problem where you uh, have to do uh, some work. Um, you have to reason across this boundary between your logic engine and your uh, database engine. And then the, the literature was perhaps viewed by some as overly dry. Uh, a lot of the examples just had A, Bs, and Cs in them and weren't that semantic. Uh, and there wasn't much explanation about saying, well, if you're interested in these kinds of, of languages, here's a way you might fit them into your existing uh, relational query engine. So, you know, I can't say for sure which of these was more important than the others or that there weren't uh, other reasons, but these are some uh, that came to light where I, when I pulled some of the early people in the field. But even during this decline phase, there were important contributions. Um, this, I think this idea of, uh, you know, picking a language uh, that you could evaluate without extra logical features, uh, got people thinking about a declarative reset for logic programming, how far could we extend this? Uh, I think out of this, you started seeing things as you know, alternatives to negation as failure, such as stable model semantics, uh, where you didn't have to rely on the operational nature of, of query evaluation. Um, there was some influence in knowledge representation. Uh, it inferred, was influence on languages for things like graph-based representations. Uh, you know, if you look at Sparkle for RDF, it looks a lot like kind of a data log-like language with uh, triples as your predicates. And then there was, you know, the relational databases did add some support for recursion um, in, in limited forms. And some of the data log techniques, such as the magic sets that Jeff mentioned, turned out to be ap applicable to non-recursive queries as well and found their way into um, some of the, the relational query optimizers. Um, furthermore, data log ended up being a nice vehicle for understanding the expressiveness and complexity of queries. You know, if I add this feature, what do I get? How much harder is it now to evaluate queries? Uh, and I think you'll hear some from Moshe along these lines in the next talk. So then there was this resurgence of interest. Uh, people started turning back to data log, maybe around 1998. And you know, over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of applications of it. Um, in some cases is the basis for, for a data management system, but often in other areas, um, some, new some new areas that were coming into, that were new at least two decades ago, such as this, semantic web where you wanted deductive capabilities and also things where you wanted to get beyond imperative approaches uh, and there was work in program analysis and networking here what you have is complex reasoning but moderate amounts of data the data the machine started getting big enough having big enough memories that in many cases you could read everything you wanted into memory and work in it there So some of the application areas, as I mentioned, semantic web, um, there were description logic based approaches, but there were also rule based approaches and even a rule interchange format and then combinations of the two. If you look at uh, OWL RF, it's basically the lies at the intersection of OWL and data log. Um, a lot of work in program analysis, if you look at what program analysis is, it's a lot of graph queries. So you're doing graph traversals to do call chains. There's mutual recursions for pointer aliasing. And people saw that it was quite tricky to get the algorithms correct and make them easily modifiable for working uh, on these kinds of things. And some of them refer to data log as a sweet spot between expressiveness and efficiency in this area. Also, 
you know, sort of a compact representation that you could reason about and convince yourself that it was true. Um, and then also this work in declarative networking um, where people were using data log like languages for expressing protocol, network protocol services, monitoring. Um, you had the advantage of being able to reason over both uh, extensional data like link tables and intentional data such as uh, state transition rules. Okay. And so the interesting work here about using this to uh, these approaches to define overlay networks or analyze event sequences. There's often some very cool stuff where it actually helped you understand alternate proto protocols out there for certain network operations. Because what you'd see is that, um, you know, essentially this protocol and that protocol was just like the switch, you know, a switch in order of two sub goals or, you know, a slightly different binding pattern. Um, and so seeing how these protocols related to each other became more possible with these uh, succinct declarative representations. And then most recently, um, I've been seeing the use of data log for scalable analytics. Um, one of the ear earlier efforts of this was Socialite and distributed Socialite for analyzing social network graphs. Um, Miria at the University of Washington for um, that allows you to use data log to do iterative analytics. Uh, big data log that helps you do recursive analyses and spark. Uh, Yeta log was uh, sort of a data, data parallel system coming out of Google, as I recall. Um, deals was, again, data log taking advantage of multi core processing. Uh, one of the things that I see as a common thread across these is that you have to do more than vanilla data log. In particular, you need aggregates. I mean, if you think about big data, you've, you're working at getting it, you know, the big data smaller so you can learn something about it. Okay, I think that's uh, the end of what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Very interesting. I'm sure that'll lead to questions, uh, certainly for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, and finally, of our third speaker, Moshe, are you ready to go? Great. We don't hear you. Are you unmuted? Are you muted? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I will try to kind of interpolate between the presentation by Jeff and the presentation by, by Dave. And I call it data log, data log plus plus, and data log minus minus. So um, here is a kind of a recap of the history. Uh, in 1970, code, Ted Code proposed the relational model. It has two, I think, important ideas. One, that we store data in relation tables, but tables are mathematical relations. And then you can use first order logic as a query language, and that gave rise to the, the, the tuple calculus, the relational calculus, et cetera, but and eventually SQL. But the idea is first order logic is your canonical query language. And then there was a paper that Jeff did not mention. It was a popular paper from, but with, with Al Ejo in 1979. And they point out that there are certain queries that cannot be expressed in first order logic. And these queries have to do mostly with connectivity, with transitive closure, with reachability. And they require fixed point computation. In fact, the example that, they, that, that Jeff showed require fixed point computation. Now, Galer Minkel and, and Jean-Marie Nicolas came from the logic programming side. And again, they proposed to use logic program as query languages. And as Jeff mentioned, he came up with this idea of trying to kind of suck the middle ground. You need to go beyond first order logic, but you shouldn't go all the way to, to full logic programming and use just whole function free 
function free logic program, horn clauses. China and RL came up with the same idea of function free horn clauses. And, and Dave Meyer was the, the namer of, of data log. And he didn't tell us how he came up with this name. I would like to put a question on your stack, Dave. I'd like to know how you came up with this beautiful name. So that's how we end up with, with, uh, with data log. Now, Jeff has worked in the, in the early years on, okay, how do we actually implement it? I and other people looked at it again from the more theoretical perspective. And the argument was the data log is a kind of a sweet spot. And why is it? So in 1982, Neil Emmerman and myself uh, look at fixed point logic. And we show that if you add order to your databases, then fixed point logic is precisely P time. That is everything in fixed point logic can be computed in P time and, and it captures, fully captures P time. And then Chris Papa Dimitri was able to, to sharpen it and show that this is true even for data log. Data log on other databases is in polynomial time and capture and can compute all P time queries. So this we have a this is a very beautiful kind of result. We have a, we have a query language that compute precisely the P time queries, not more and not less. But it turned out that this sweet spot was not quite the right, the right uh, sweet spot as we, as we thought. So on one hand, we start discovering the data log was, was too expressive. And, and where was it, what, where did we get it too expressive? We need to optimize. I mean, as Jeff pointed out, every, if you have a query language, you cannot really, it cannot really succeed if you don't have a, the optimization technology. And of course, Jeff, Jeff Research has gone back on compiler, on optimizing compilers. And so in the early 90s, uh, Hillebrand, Kanellakis, uh, Meyerson, and myself showed that uh, that boundedness of data log query is undecidable. And the boundedness was the question you're given a recursive query, is it just, is the syntax recursive or is it inherently recursive? Maybe there is a way you can look at the syntax and figure out that you don't need uh, more than the five level of recursion. And then essentially it, it, it becomes a big conjunctive, you know, conjunctive queries, and we know much better how to optimize it. And we show that this is undecidable. And a couple of years later, uh, Odette Shmueli showed that the equivalence of data log programs and other kind of basic optimization question are two given queries equivalent is also undecidable. And we actually discovered that uh, almost everything about data log is undecidable. Now, of course, if we're dealing with first order logic as query language, also everything is undecidable. But the reality is that we didn't use, you rarely use full first order logic. And when you do queries, the, the dominant thing are conjunctive queries. And conjunctive queries are generally, everything about them is decidable. There is issue of complexity, computation complexity, but generally speaking, Conjunctive queries do form a kind of a unit conjunctive queries. They have a sweet spot. And the, intu the early intuition was, well, we're just adding recursion. It can be too, too bad. But it turned out it is, once we add recursion, you can really see the similarities between data log syntax and context-free grammars. And as we know, everything but context-free languages is also undecidable, almost everything. So from that point of view, data log already emerges too, is too expressive. And that gave a motivation to try to look for fragments of data log that will be good enough for applications, but um, more decidability properties for applications. And if the source of undecidability in data log was the, the general fixed point, the answer is let's try to limit fixed point. And instead of using general fixed point, in, in many, many of the application that we see, is especially those that involve graphs and networks, graph databases, social network, communication networks, program analysis, where we again typically read, reason about reachability. It's enough to use transitive closure. So we call this fragment regular data log because of kind of the connection to regular languages that again, if you think about the context free grammar has general fixed point and, and regular languages only have the clinic star, which is transitive closure. And so in 2015, Reuter, Romero, and I showed that, that this fragment equivalence is, a, is, dis, is decidable. It's just two aspects complete, so it's not exactly very friendly, 
but uh, we have learned by now that this uh, worst case complexity result don't always tell us how it is hard in practice. To the best of my knowledge, the question of boundedness for regular data log is still open. I, I will be happy to learn if there's any progress on that. Again, regular data log was kind of a sweet spot because in many applications, you do not need full fixed point. It's enough to reason about connectivity and reachability, and you can do it uh, with reg regular data log. In fact, there's a whole, I mean, the, the way we came into regular data log was coming from below. We have a, on graph database, regular path queries, and then we start extending regular path queries and ultimate extension of regular path queries became regular data log. On the other hand, I would argue the data log is not expressive enough. And for that, again, I will go back to the, to the Paleolithic period where in 1980, again, Jeff, together with uh, Hank Horst, had a paper in uh, the pre-pods days. This was the XP1 workshop on database theory. XP stands for X Princeton. This is when the move to Stanford happened, but Jeff wanted to connect with a Princeton student. And Jeff and Hank proposed System U, where they uh, propose a database system based on universal relation assumption. And the idea was that that the relational databases gave us one dimension of independence, which we call physical data independence. You didn't have to worry about what is the data structure, how are the relations stored in the database. That was an implementation issue. From the point of view of the user, all the user had to think about is about uh, is about the relational about the relational schema. But it turned out that the reasoning about relational schema or keeping in mind relational schema is also, it works very well if you have like three relations, but if you have a, a large database with many relations, and in particular, uh, databases go under refactoring and sometimes you need to change what relations they are. You take a view and you materializing, you take a relation and you decompose it, and then you have to rewrite all your queries. So the relation, universal relation idea was, let's just imagine that everything sits in one relation and how to build that relation is a matter again of implementation. And I thought that was a wonderful idea, but for strange reasons that I don't fully understand, it caused tremendous, it caused tremendous ire. It was really a very provocative idea. Uh, the first uh, kind of this, you know, vicious attack was by, by Bill Kent in a Todd's paper, the assumption of universal relation is incompatible with some aspect of relational type of theory and practice. And Jeff had to respond to that. And there was, there was other paper that attacked the universal relation. In fact, kind of to me, the ultimate attack was that in 1988, I wrote a paper in IEEE software, kind of expository paper about the universal relation. And Ted Code wrote the letter to the editor. I believe universal relation model fails completely as an alternative to, to relational data model. And at that point, I'm a fairly young researcher with much more hair on my head. And to see such, a, such an attack by Ted Code was a, was a very sobering experience because I had to respond both vigor vigorously, but also very politely. And uh, I'm an Israeli, the, vig the vigorous part is easy. The polite part is a bit more of a challenge for me. So I wrote, I'm flattered that Code, who is the father of the rational model, who pioneered many of the basic concepts of relational database theory, took the time to read and respond to my article. And I explained that we are not trying to replace the universal, the universal relation model, but we are trying to evolve it. And this is to us, it's an interface on top of a relational database. Um, but, you know, the kind of, this, if you know about the history of the, what was called the relational wars of the mid seventies, Ted's, even though Ted, uh, Ted, codes, Ted went from about, I think, 11 years from paper to Turing Award, which, which today is almost unimaginable that in 10, 11 years, you, you publish a paper, 11 years later, you get a Turing Award for it. But there was, there was very bitter wars in the middle and Ted was very, very defensive. And it really had a hard time dealing with any attempt to improve upon the relational model. But it turns out that this idea is fundamental <clears throat> is fundamental enough that it's just it just people keep reinventing it. And I had I had I didn't put here too many references, but I used to send Jeff every couple of years. Oh, here is another reinvention of the universal relation model. 
And in fact, you know, if you want to use kind of a bit of historical revisionism, I would say inverse relation was the first no SQL model. Okay. And in the 1980s, Dave and Jeff and, and I decided to kind of to, to put a formal foundation of the of the universal relation model. And it's a paper in the cent in the center, the Todd's 84 paper that I think is the kind of exposition of this idea. And as we have, you know, about, about uh, you know, in the 2000, people came up with the, with the data exchange approach. I mean, I think Fokion here is the, is one of the people that I saw in the audience and he, and together with other people received, I believed in 2020, the, the church award it's a, in for the, from the SIGLOG church award for contribution data exchange. Universal relation was the very first instance of data exchange. You view the, the databases it is given as a source database and the universal relation as a target database. And then you get queries over the universal relation. And the question is how to compile them into queries on the source, on the source database, on the source database. And we developed the theory of how to do that using data dependencies and the chase. And so the key, the key algorithmic infrastructure for both universal relation and data exchange is to do the chase. It's another algorithm that originally uh, Dave was one of the of the originate of this algorithm and the name. Probably he came up with the name, given his ability to come up with clever name. I suspect that he gave the name Chase, and it was Chase with respect to embedded data dependencies. And embedded data dependencies are really data log with existential quantifiers. Or put differently, it's data log with the column functions brought back. Remember that we had to take the column function out, the function out, function symbol out, because they were too expressive. But in this case, we, we bring them back in, but in a careful way. So we don't have we don't have the full Turing computability. Yes, we have to have column values added or kind of marked null, marked nulls but it is done in a way that you are still able to control the computational complexity. And this was true both for, for so universal relation and for data exchange. And Georg Gottlob and his collaborators took this approach further and they defined what they call data, data log plus minus. And this was a family of languages for ontology querying. So going back to the description logic world and the semantic web world, and they, and they wrote plain data log is extended, but also syntactically restricted. So it should, to achieve decidability and even tractability. So you are walking between the kind of the Scylla and Cabrides of, of you, you know, is it is again what, what we call before the Goldilocks. And the thought was the data log was the kind of the sweet spot. And the answer is not necessarily, as we saw in some cases, data log is too expressive. But in other cases, people did explore extending it, for example, again, with, with, uh, with column functions, but restricting it syntactically. So we will not have, for example, infinite generation of, of, uh, of new values, because that gives us the power of Turing computability. And another view on that, you can go by going to the paper by Victor Vianu, who had uh, described what he called the paper now it puts from the gem, gem of, gems of ports, data log unchained. And again, he described a family of data log like languages, a unified formalism can express important class of queries, including fixed point while all the way to computable queries. And the pointing out is that different variants are adopted in different settings. So as, as one of the things that Dave mentioned that for why data log was not quickly adopted was lack of applications. But it took more years for different applications to emerge. And as different applications emerged, it became clear that they needed, they needed different versions of data log, not just the vanilla data log, but maybe data log minus minus or data log plus plus, or as Gottlob and his colleagues call it, and Gottlob and his colleague received the Church Award this year for, for their work on using data log for web extraction. And again, you, you, you go carefully you know, there is always the tension between expressiveness and, and complexity, and you navigate this thread of very, very carefully. So 
my conclusion is that uh, we used to think of data log as a single language, but I think now that we are older and wiser, we need to understand, no, it's a family of languages, and there is a trade-off between, as I said, between expressiveness and complexity, and we have to navigate this trade-off carefully, walk on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the edge, navigating according to the application at hand. The application at hand would tell us how expressive or what's the complexity ought to be. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moshe. Okay, very interesting. Um, so I think there is one question that we need to, so we now will start the question uh, and discussion period. Um, and I think Moshe po posed the first question, uh, which was to Dave Meyer saying, okay, where did this name data log, how did you come up with the name data log? Now, I, I actually was present at the creation, so uh, I, can, I can hold Dave to uh, at least a, a minimum of honesty there. Dave? Okay, so uh, David and I both got, well, I had, I had first seen uh, logic programming, uh, a guy named John Soa at, at IBM Research in New York had showed it to me and sort of looking at it. And then um, David had joined the department and he had been using um, logic programming like, like approaches for natural language parsing. Uh, and we, uh, you know, started talking about this and, you know, sort of saying, well, it'd be an interesting thing to teach about, but there's not a great textbook. And so we started on this book, um, Programming and Logic, uh, and we wanted to introduce sort of two two parts to things. One was sort of the underlying theory of resolution theorem proving, and then the t techniques for efficient evaluation, such as um, uh, structure sharing. And it can be very complex when you've got function symbols and variables and such flying around. And so we figured out, hey, let's do this in, in phases. And there's a lot we can explain just with um, propositional logic and no variables whatsoever. And so that the obvious name for that is prop log for propositional logic. And then, um, you know, at the other end, we were going to get to prolog that had, you know, variables and function symbols, but an interesting stopping point along the way is where you add variables. So you've got predicates and, but you don't have function symbols. And so you don't have to worry about sort of, um, um, Unification is, is a bit easier to explain in that in that case. Um, and so what do you call the one in the middle? And I think there were some candidates um, like Predlog or something like that. Uh, and then I went home one evening um, and just sort of realized, well, gee, function free, you know, predicates, those are like relations. And so this is like data. And so I came, so data log popped in my head. I came back the next day and said to David, what do you think of data log? And he said, yeah, that's great. And so it's interesting. It, it actually, I think I started using it in a, a class I was teaching. And then I think I would made visits down to Stanford. Um, Moshe was visiting sometimes, uh, work with Jeff and I started Think calling it data log there. And so I think the first mention of data log in print wasn't actually in anything I wrote um, because our, we were, you know, we were still putting the book together. <laughs> the book didn't come out till 83. And I think there were mentions of it in the literature in 82 or something. No, so that's 80, my. It was 89 that the book came out of. I think the mentions were like 84. You're. You're making me older than I know. I'm oh, older. right, right, right. That was, I've got the books wrong. Yeah, right. no, 80, 80, yeah, no, 89, you're right. So there were some mentions of it. People started, the name, the name got traction even before the book came out. So we can't really say, in one sense, the book gave rise to the name, but not through its publication. I think, I think, Dave, we started using it even way before the book came out. We started, yeah. we wrote paper, we started using it. Yes. Right, now I've, I've tracked down some uses of it prior to the... Probably 85, 85 or 86, I think. Probably yeah, like, I mean, it was, it, was there, it was there in lecture notes I was using, but, you know, those weren't published. Okay, well, thank you, thank you. Okay, do we have... Uh, I, we can take questions from the floor or, or discussion. Uh, 
I, I want to make I want to make a comment about Dave's talk, and Please. and because kind of I look back and I think that uh, one of the reasons for what happened with data log is I would say is is a cultural problem, and it's easy to point to some figure in the database world and say oh they are at fault, but really I think it's a it was the kind of the theory the pods uh, the pods uh, sigmoid kind of cultural gap which is that uh, Pod thought, uh, people Pod thought we just do, we just have to do theory. We have to write elegant, elegant mathematics. And, uh, and the people at Sigmund thought we are doing real database practice. Anything that's not practical should not be here. There was a panel some years, I don't remember exactly when, that um, Avi Schilbersatz organized. It was um, theory and practice in database research. And first it was going to be theory versus practice. And I fought hard to change the, the versus to end. So it would be less antagonistic. And the, and the three panelists were, I think it was Jeff maybe representing pods. And I forgot who is representing Sigmod. And there was one person from the industry. So was it you? Do you remember it, Jeff? Was it you? I the don't panel? So yeah, anyway, the pods, the pods, the, age, but, you know. The, the pods person the, for the pods person theory was pods and practice was sigma. Mm -hmm. For the sigma person, theory was pods and practice was was a uh, was a uh, sigma. For the industry person, pods did not exist. It was somewhere in outer space. Did not really exist. Sigma was theory. Industry was practice. And the most, the deep, the only thing I remember out of this panel is the insight that I got that what is theory, what is practice is very often in the eye of the beholder. But unfortunately, and I discovered it in a, in a, in a for me, a rather painful way in the, you know, when, when in the later on in the 90s, in the 2000s, I wanted to take some of the work, you know, Fukun and I had made some connection between questions in, in, in databases, conjunctive queries and consent satisfaction. And I really wanted to pursue it in, you know, in empirical research. And I had a, a PhD student that uh, took these ideas and actually implemented conjunctive query optimization and showed that you can do much, much better than the standard cost-based optimization. And we submitted very, we're very proud. It was submitted a paper to POTS where we take the POTS ideas and we show that they really work. And the paper was rejected from POTS because uh, experiment, who does experiments here? We want theorem, you don't have any theorem. And that was for me, was kind of the beginning of the end of my active, active database uh, research because when I submitted also an SF proposal with the same idea, again, people rejected it because you're not, it's, it's, it, it didn't fit nicely in the Sigmund world or in the POTS world. And I think this cultural gap was really ultimately bad for research. That that uh, we kind of have a preconceived notion what research ought to, what good research ought to be like instead of looking at the substance. And so we can just blame certain characters for it, but I think we should kind of look at the mirror and and look at the culture and and blame somewhat all of us by having this very rigid preconceived notion of what is good research. Interesting comment. Yeah, you, you know, it, uh, maybe I just just add something. I, I have always uh, I, I see the the uh, the distinction between pods and sigma somewhat differently. The paper that I published on what later became called datalog was not in pods; it was in sigma. Okay, um, and um, th but the next year the attitude at Sigma was, well, we've already heard about logic. Okay. And um, well, now let's go, let's do something new. That, that is the, the Sigma model of research is people throwing out new ideas and those ideas, you know, they're fully formed and, and there's no, no need to do anything further about it. Uh, whereas in pods or really any theory conference, you sort of recognize that research is a it's an ongoing process and and the way you do your research is you publish ideas people read what you have done and do better and 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 keep going on so so uh you know so I, th that to me has always been the need for a conference like uh like this one or or, or, or pods uh 
uh, as opposed to uh, to, to a, a, a sigmod or its or its its ilk. I, Benjamin has a question. Benjamin. Yes. <clears throat> so it's very interesting to hear about this history. Uh, Moshe, I, I had a question about your uh, sort of punchline uh, about, you know, think of data log as a family of languages. Um, so uh, let me just start with a quick observation, which is uh, in the semantic web, the people working on rule stuff, I mean, logic programming is at the center of that. But I, I wouldn't say exactly that people thinking in terms of the of data log is exactly the center. Yes, it was uh, pretty much crucial for the OWL rules, which is the most used part of uh, implemented ontologies for semantic web and knowledge graphs uh, then and still. But um, there's a, a big difference, which is uh, having negation, you know, body negation as well. And a, a critical distinction there is if you uh, are based on well-founded, you can have decidability and tractability without much uh, compromise, uh, especially practically. And so I guess my big question here is um, when thinking about data log as a family of languages, you know, maybe with a bit more expressiveness, carefully introduced and, and you know, preserving some good properties, especially decidability and tractability uh, or less. Um, why is, why not think of including negation? Why, why is that sort of outside or over the edge of what to consider here? It's, it's actually much easier to deal with negation than it is with functions or existentials fundamentally. I, I mean, some of my best, some of my best friends are negations. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have an ideological uh, uh, opposition to negation. To me, the, the, the point is, I mean, if I look, and I have to admit, I have not been followed what is the research today that happens in logic programming. But at least at that time, logic programming was an attempt to be a general approach to programming. It meant to be, you know, a, a different paradigm, you know, I mean, there was a paradigm of imperative programming and then people came up with a different paradigm to general programming, okay? In general programming, you don't worry too much about, I mean, when we have programs, we know that almost everything about programs is undecidable. And we said, this is okay, this is the cost for, for paying for general programming. But to me, the point in data log is, is that we are continually searching for a sweet spot. And I think my observation is that there is no unique sweet spot. That what you, your sweet spot is depends on the context, on the application context. In some cases, you need decidability of equivalence. In other cases, you may not need it, okay? And uh, if you can add negation and still navigate this trade-off between expressiveness and tractability for a particular application, you know, all the better, all the better to you. I mean, I go ahead, do it. I mean, I, you'll have my blessing. So to me, this is the answer of data log is searching for a sweet spot. And I can, if I want, if I want to rephrase my conclusion was there's no unique sweet spot. What the sweet spot is, is application dependent. And in fact, some, some of this extension by, 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 by Gottlob add some form, some form of negation, of negation, but in a limited way, for example, I remember the inequalities, okay? So, so the point is just continue to look for a, for a sweet spot between expressiveness and tractability, depending on the context. Yeah, I'll, I'll add here that, um, ex, you know, data log extensions with negation were there from very early on. Um, and there's sort of another, another dimension along which um, kind of, you look at variants of it and and one is you know with language features but the other one is is program forms and so you know very early on we figured out that you had to have programs that were safe this this thing that jeff had yeah is saying that that very you had to have you couldn't have variables in the in the head that didn't show up in the body and then uh, another thing was called stratified negation which was saying, okay, you can use negation, but you can't have it going through, um, you can't have it going through recursion. And so you had to be able to write your program in, in Strata uh, such that 
there was no negation, you know, negation only happened sort of between strata. So I, th I think it's, you know, people have looked at negation and how it interacts with things. Uh, sometimes the limitations though are, uh, there are limitations on the form of programs you can uh, write and evaluate effectively. The whole issue of negation is something that I wanted to, to talk to bring up and I'm not sure how relevant it is. My, my historical view is that when uh, the database people, you guys started looking at data log, it was obvious that prologue's negation was wrong, right? It was obvious to you because prologue's negation would go into infinite loops. And so, I mean, you didn't have transitive closure. You didn't, I mean, the, the nat, I'm sorry, the natural transitive closure that everybody knows and loves wasn't transitive closure in prologue, right? Because it goes into an infinite loop. Uh, so anyway, we sort of knew, the logic programming community sort of knew about that, but didn't worry too much about it. It's a big programming language. And so of course they're gonna be into the loop. So ain't a big deal. But once we looked at it in terms of, of the database world where everything's finite, and of course there's, you can do better with negation than prolog. Prolog's just ridiculous with negation. Okay, so you brought attention to that and that spurred uh, a whole bunch of research in the 80s about negation in logic programming. And as Dave was just mentioning, stratified programs was sort of the first thing. And then, uh, but then the problem with stratification, it seemed that each definition of stratification, there was another, a more refined definition that would get more programs that you wanted to have sense, but weren't included in the previous. So you got local stratification, you got dynamic stratification, you got Anyway, and eventually, in a year or two, people came up with more complete ideas of, strata, of, of negation in logic programming. And that really did a bifurcation, what happened. We had well-founded semantics, which came from, from um, Van Gelder and friends out of Jeff Ullman's group. Um, and we got stratified, uh, I'm sorry, uh, stable, stable models. Stable models. Stable models. And those actually are radically different semantics, as people know. Um, and actually, the logic program community, Moshe, to give you a little bit of background about what's going on in the logic program community for the past 10 years, it's been what's called answer sent programming, which if you look at our, our program now, 70% of the papers, 80% of the papers you are about answer set programming. Answer set programming is basically data log under Strata, uh, under stable model semantics. Plus, I mean, a lot of other stuff, but that's the um, sort of the foundation. So the logic programming community has gone in the stable model work direction very strongly. Um, and yet data log to all of you guys is uh, either stratified or um, well-founded semantics, if you wanna, so, so it, it, it's a different, it's that very different semantics. Um, anyway, that's, that's my two cents. I'm, uh, I, I, I guess I, I mean, I have a, I have an opinion of which semantics I'm more interested in, but, um, anyway, I, I, I don't know. Do you have, you have thoughts on that? Are you, am I, am I correct in my, uh, interpretation from your point of view? Um, do you have thoughts on that? You're asking whom? Any of you three. It, um, it's okay. <laughs> I think Dave might be in the best position to answer that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's okay. I, I don't, I'm not trying to put people on the spot. So, I was no, just, I, I, so I, I, I tell you, so one reason I think the stable model, and again, I'm, this is from 50,000 feet. So um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. There is an advantage of, of of stable model semantics. They, you can describe the semantic by kind of means of constraints. And the emergence of, the, emergence of, of uh, the, the SAT revolution gave a, a very powerful engine for unsensed programming. And in that point of view, and uh, which I think unsensed programming have really, it, I, I view it as kind of a, one of the most major accomplishment ultimately of, of logic programming. And I think the weakness of, uh, 
of the well-founded semantics. It, it doesn't have, it, you, still, you still have to do like solve by iteration. And it doesn't, you don't have the, you don't, you're not, I've, I've not seen able to, we're able to leverage the, the emergence of such powerful solvers. So this, I think one, one reason that I think that uh, stable model semantics became very popular, it, it was more, more amenable to, to leverage the, the progress in the constraint satisfaction community broadly conceived. Interesting. So, yep. so, so if I can also make a comment that stable model semantics is now also available under under prolog. So prolog extended with negation that follows a stable model semantics uh, in the SCAF system that that we built. So and it's available and put in a lot of applications. And one of the problems with well-founded semantics, of course, is that moment you have any kind of looping, you know, you have to sort of give up which stable model semantics will actually find. Uh, uh, multiple models. So, so um, just just to add something here, um, you know, it was interesting to me that there was this company Logic Blocks that existed for a while that was founded by Molam Arif and was, you know, I thought a very interesting um, effort. Uh, for one thing, it you know, he actually dusted off all these papers from the 80s and found out that some of them, yes, some of these evaluation techniques are quite, are actually quite practical and, and valuable. You know, it's just, there's there's this time scale difference of like Sigmod, you know, is it going to go into the next release of the product versus, you know, sort of the pods thing of saying, well, this is interesting. And at some point, you know, the technology might catch up with it. But one of the interesting things about logic blocks is is sort of this view that, um, it is about constraint satisfaction and, but that you can have various ways to do that, that constraint satisfaction. You can, you know, resolution theorem proving or SAT solver or, you know, a, um, an arithmetic reasoner. So, you know, they had this idea that you write these programs and that you get to a point where you have a constraint network and then you decide, okay, what's the right solver for that? And I think that's a very, that was a very interesting idea of saying, you know, we don't have to choose necessarily, um, you know, what our evaluation technology is, depending on what kind of constraints we form, we can go to something that, that works well for that. And the fact that there, yeah, as, as Moshi points out, that there's now quite efficient SAT solvers sort of, you know, says that that is a viable uh, evaluation engine. There is a question in the chat I'd like to respond to, which is about the tension today between kind of logic and between KR, knowledge representation and, and machine learning. So I think there are kind of somewhat, somewhat different dimensions there. I think, I think Jeff Ullman, maybe many, many years ago, pointed out to me the difference between um, computer science and, and electrical engineering is it's electrical engineering, there are no theory conferences. Like, they would maybe have a conference on, on signal processing. And th that conference will have maybe some theoretical papers and some more empirical papers. But it's not, we are theoreticians, we are the, the, somehow the, the practitioner, so to speak. And in my research, I said that there is, where I see it is, for example, the computer edit verification conference, CAV, that started in the, in the early 90s. And I've been involving it now for, for many years. And the principle actually was put very nicely some, uh, uh, some years ago by Ken McMillan. And he said, here is how CAV should, should judge paper. One is uh, a, a good paper should make interesting new claims. You should say, here is, here is a, an, an assertion that is novel and interesting. And the paper should also provide evidence for that claim. And the evidence could be analytical in the form of a proof or it could be empirical. And the, the unfortunate thing that very often conference somehow take it, uh, no, 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 we have, there is an ideology. It's like POTS is about principle and principle means theorems. And eventually I think after, after my paper was rejected, I think people felt bad about it and the various attempt, and I'm not quite sure, but I think, I think that uh, later, Pots became a bit more, more uh, ecumenical. I had a, a, a student that he did work on, uh, 
on uh, model counting, counting, counting uh, approximate model counting, counting the number of, let's say, truth assignment to bullet proportional formulas, which is a, a classical problem and some of the foundation by laid out in stock paper by Larry Stockmeyer. And he had interesting improvement of the theory that, that also, excuse me, how do I stop it? Okay. He had interesting improvement for the theory and he also was able to leverage it and run experiments and show good result that this is a theory that also work well in practice. And he thought, this is great. I have a theory and experiment, I'll submit it to stock. And the paper was rejected from stock because if you have experiment, you don't belong here. And I really think that this is this is approach is just bad for, it's bad for research. This, no, 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 we only do research of one particular style. KR versus ML is, a, is there is beyond just, the, it's true that much of ML is, a, is very empirical. But there, there is again a little more, more of an ideological battle about what AI should be about, and and for some people, this symbolic AI that is logic-based AI is viewed as as the wrong path of the past, and now we have discovered the real the real future of AI. It's all going to be about machine learning, and again, I think this this ideological approaches are bad for research, and in fact, one of today one of the cutting edge in in uh, in in AI is what they call neurosymbolic reasoning. How do we take the best of all possible worlds? How do we take the symbolic approach? Some people associate with Kahneman like slow thinking and connect it to his machine learning, which is again, Kahneman fast thinking. How do we marry these things? And that to me is actually the interface you find sometimes the most interesting research. So the general answer to this, that, that these ideologies that this conference, we only do type X and, and other, other things should not be, are not admissible here. It just, it's a bad culture and it's bad for research. I might mention that there's an invited speaker later in the conference, Stu, Stu Russell, who has a really interesting, and I think he will say it, I'm not sure what his invited speech, but, uh, talk is about, but I suspect he will uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, the, the machine learning versus symbolic processing uh, divide. And he has some, I think, some really interesting things to say. So I would encourage people to check that one out. Okay, uh, I guess we have Paul Turow. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, elaborate a little bit and uh, see the panel's uh, opinion on uh, uh, the neurosymbolic side uh, when specialized to data law. Of course, uh, we have seen in, in Jeff's presentation, even those simple B and F annotations would tell you what could be reasonably asked from a, a machine learning system, a neural network, for instance. Obviously, it wouldn't uh, uh, be uh, as easy to do it in general logic programming with unification, which is very hard to, to model in terms of uh, uh, what a neural network would do for uh, implementing unification, for instance. So by restricting neurosymbolics to data log, there are a number of approaches out in the literature, but I'm wondering uh, what are the intuitions of the panel uh, members about how those would connect uh, with uh, a restriction to the data log framework? And you sharpen your question. Yeah, that's yeah. I I, I agree. Um, uh, uh, can you try uh, to summarize it in let's say two sentences? Uh, <laughs> yes. How you would do neurosymbolic computation uh, with data log, and what would be the restrictions and the model that you would use if you would had uh, to do that uh, connection? So. I'll, I'll give you an example. So I have written a paper uh, maybe about 15 years ago that uh, looked at what happened to... Uh, so there is a, a result by Immermann that look what happened, you have alternation of least and greatest fixed point. And Immermann shown you collapse it into just least fixed point, but it does at the, at the cost is an expansion of the arity of the relations. 
and expanding arc of relation cause exponential blow up, unfortunately. And I have, uh, together with a postdoc, uh, Doron Bustan, we have shown that instead, you can do it by extending the domain instead of just being Boolean, you need somewhat richer underlying domain, numerical domain. And you do um, fixed point, least fixed point, but on top of this richer numerical domain rather than just, just Boolean logic. And this seems to me, and I'm very fascinated by the possible connection between these and what's called today GNN, which is one of the models mentioned for neurosymbolic reasoning, which does come in computation over graphs by essentially commute the fixed point of functions on the neighborhood of nodes. So I think it's a, you're asking a very good question. I don't have a, a solid answer, but there are some hints that there might be some kind of an integration between this view, one view of, of a, a machine learning, neurosymbol reasoning that looks, looks, now the problem has structure, it's a graph. So it has a structure rather than just sequence. So before that it was six of sequence in machine vision, just pixel or in language, just uh, characters. And now we have a structure, we're trying to use a structure and we have a structure, you're kind of getting a bit closer to our world of, of reasoning, which use structures to reason. So. Maybe, maybe, maybe something would emerge there. Yeah. So, if, if, yeah, if I, you know, if somebody, somebody, you know, told me tomorrow, you know, you have to start working on um, neurosymbolic programming with data log, um, probably I would try to twist it back to a database problem. And one of the big things, I mean, the ML approaches have gotten someplace often because you can just get these enormous corpora of, of data to, um, you know, abstract from and, and train these high dimensional models on. Um, but, you know, one of the things that makes database queries go fast is, is access methods. And they take very many different forms, um, indexes, bit vectors, um, bloom filters or whatever. It's, you know, you're computing something about your data to make it access to it faster. And so I would want to look to see, you know, when you're training and, and evaluating these neurosymbolic models, what are the access patterns to the data? And do we have the right access methods uh, to, to get at large amounts of data in this context? Um, so that's what comes to my mind. Jeff, you had something? No. No, I uh, actually had never even heard the term neurosymbolic. But, uh, I, I, might, I, I, might I, I believe, I, I know that it sounds to me like something that Yuri Leskovich does very well. Uh, for example, he's uh, my uh, colleague at Stanford uh, who does uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, inferring models about uh, nodes of a, of a, of a graph. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of out of this. But. Yeah, they had a, a workshop with 7,000 participants uh, two days ago, exactly yeah. on uh, on what uh, you are saying. Yeah. yeah, Paul, you gave a talk yesterday on, uh, on using neural nets to try to get faster access to data, to learn access to data. So, I, I mean, I think your work is exactly sort of what Dave is suggesting. I'm, I'm, Unless I'm missing something. Absolutely, that's uh, exactly what I did: improving indexing uh, or replacing uh, indexer with a neural network. But uh, uh, Moshe's suggestion is also very interesting, uh, uh, referring to graph neural networks because that's relational reasoning and propagation uh, over uh, the network. Uh, it's almost like transitive closures computed uh, by the neural networks as they adjust their weights. Uh, so it's very, very similar to relational computation. Um, okay, do we have other questions? Does Benjamin still have his hand up? Is it have to... Or is it just step from before? before? That's, we need a question that has a 20 second answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Well, David had some questions himself. 
Well, I had I, I asked the questions that I I think my my questions have been sort of and they're, they're the ones no means of the twenty second. Yeah. <laughs> Annie Annie organized the panel, so Annie, do you have any question we have That's not right. answered should, yet? That's right. Let, we let Annie have the last word. Well, <laughs> well, but thank you all for your um, very very interesting and and uh, informative talk and the views. Actually, the, I thought I had studied a lot about the data log. There are a lot of things. I mean, a lot of things I didn't know that you talked about. Uh, so actually, while I was thinking a very short question was, <laughs> I don't know if this really fit in here, but uh, I know of course David Warren. I'm even probably Jeff did, but I was wondering I like, think you know, the, does the Moshe or, or David actually program something with data log? <laughs> oh. That's a 20 second question, right? <laughs> yes. I, I, uh, my, my father was drawing these, um, he was a mathematician, but he got interested in art and he was, he was drawing these pictures that had to do with like all the paths uh through a, you know a little a little grid and he'd draw all of them and color them in certain ways and he, he wanted something to generate all the possible paths um for him and so i sort of sat down with him and you know wrote a little basically search thing uh i found some on i mean it was it was an online prologue interpreter but i was it was a data log program i wrote and uh, he seemed to be able to understand what I was doing, whereas if I'd written it for him in C++ or C Sharp, I'm sure he wouldn't have followed along. <laughs> that sounds great. I have not programmed in another log. Or <laughs> okay. I, 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 I had a one, just, just as I was actually opening up my window, I just realized uh, how beautiful to see um, more people, in fact, at the meeting yesterday, I, if only the speaker had the, the 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 camera on for whatever arrangement, and now we have at least several of you. I was wondering if this this is completely. I, I just thought even just open up now the whole whole view. Is it possible to ask people for those who want to to turn on their camera and we take a picture together? This is such a wonderful panel. You know, you don't get these uh, this historical view and data log. I only believe as time goes, it will become more important, both theoretically. And in practice, it's just my own, you know, limited belief. Okay, and actually, I'm really bad at taking picture. If some of you are good at doing this, please. Actually, my kids are the one who take, you know, pictures <laughs> on Zoom uh, on the windows. You're um, probably gonna have to take like three pictures to get all the. Yeah, actually, this is seem to be limited, right? It's not all the people. That's really, really. Yeah, bad. Uh, I mean, there is a limit but, of uh, what is it, six times. Six times five, only thirty people no, on one. No, seven by school. seven. The, the, the default I is see. right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. De depending depending on your on your laptop, on, depending on your computer. Yeah. Yeah, I only see on my screen see seven by seven. So anyway, some of you might be good at this, but maybe somebody can say like, <laughs> you know, I don't know, one, two, three, go or something. <laughs> there is a. Is anybody, there is, is it anybody set up to save it? Uh, okay. I I, I mean I'll I think, try one, but uh, please, I think I think we I think we're recording it. I think we're recording it. We're encoding it. Okay. Recording, so recording, recording. Oh, recording is in it. Oh, this is wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the we can also do a, a clipping tool just of a snapshot. We can, and we can still have moment. a moment to say everybody one, two, poses. Three, four, right? So nobody <laughs> is uh, doing a funny face <laughs> or if you want to. No, no. But the person, the person who is, uh, who is doing the recording needs to go between the different screens so to see everybody because you can fit everyone on one screen right and there is a yeah, very I, famous I took some snapshots i took some snapshots of the three of the three screens i mean okay there is a one of the most group pictures in science is the so-called from the solo conference in the it's about quantum quantum mechanics in some sometimes in the in the 1920s and you look at that picture and uh, half the people later on went on to win, I think like Nobel prizes. So this is a kind of a, such a <laughs> famous picture that for example, if you go to Dagstuhl, they always try to take this group picture in the hope that it will be like the solo of a conference. So maybe we, maybe. I think Moshe, it was all but three of the people in that picture got Nobel prizes or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. Some, something like that, something like that. So I don't, think, I don't think there are that many Turing awards in our lifetimes to get like 72, <laughs> 71. 
we already, Jeff doesn't need another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So is it everybody taking the picture? Uh, actually, I don't know. Yeah, I think what somebody got it? them. Somebody, somebody said they had a snapshot. Got all the screens? And they got yeah, somebody them. somebody took snapshots. Yeah, I, I so. got it. I'm Manuel Hermann and you though. I I, I you got it. Manuel, oh, great. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so well, thank, thank, thank you, Annie, for organizing this, and thanks for all yes, of you. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you all. Thank really? David and all of you. That's really yeah. impressive. The two Davids yeah. and Moshe. Thank you for. All right. Okay. Thank all right. you. So I guess we'll bring okay. this session to a close. And thank you so much for everybody who participated and was here. Thank you all. That was fun. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. I'll see, we'll see you tomorrow for more United Talks and more other talks. Yeah, thank you, Manuel. You can just share with us the, the pictures you take. You took. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'm I'm just sending them to you right.